morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Monday, February 13th, we are studying John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20. The evangelist records another one of Jesus' I am statements. What does Jesus mean when he says, I am the light of the world? To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Nate Hill. Pastor Hill serves at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas. Pastor Hill, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Thank you, Pastor Apple. Great to be with you this morning. As we get started today, Pastor Hill, let's talk context. What should we know as we prepare to look at this section of John chapter 8? Here in John chapter 8, beginning at verse 12, we're finding ourselves in the midst of Jesus' later ministry. During the time in which the opposition to Jesus from the Jewish religious officials is beginning to rise, we found at the end of chapter 7 that there was a great dispute amongst the people as to who Jesus was and to whether He was the promised Messiah to come. The uh, side that was against him wanted him to be arrested. Others believed him to be the Christ that the scriptures had foretold. And as we jump back into the text here at 8, 12 and following, we're seeing that uh, Jesus will be speaking to the Pharisees, most of whom rejected his teaching and saw him to be a threat. We do know that he's speaking to those Pharisees. Um, because that is attested to us within the text itself. And we'll also see that the location in which Jesus is speaking is at the temple, in the temple complex, specifically outside of the treasury. And that's the same area where you'll remember from Mark chapter 12, we heard the account of the humble widow, the righteous humble widow who contributed her, her might out of her poverty and did so humbly as opposed to those who were contributing out of their abundance in a showy manner. So the same place is the setting that that event took place. It's a place where the public would have been walking by. And although Jesus was speaking directly to the Pharisees in a back and forth with them, many others would have heard this teaching as well. Just looking here at John's gospel, we don't need to rehash everything we talked about in terms of the previous text and whether or not it belongs in John's gospel or not. But in terms of context, just thinking through where we've been, Jesus was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths, and back in chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, it was the last day of the feast, the great day. Jesus talked about coming to him and having living water, and now that we're going to you know, return to really, a, not a discourse, but a, a conversation with Jesus, and, and we're nowhere in the temple, in the treasury, as you said, do you think the Feast of Booths is still in play? I mean, are we still in that same context, do you think? Yeah, there is some scholarly opinion that the Feast of Booths um, would have, as well as the the water metaphor, have had light metaphor in, indeed that that would have been in mind that Jesus was speaking of. As he says, he is the light um, of the world, that it may have been sort of an object lesson again set against the background of the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. It's not something I looked into with any great detail. I don't know that it's going to really affect our understanding of Jesus' teaching here today in our day. But he, he did use those uh, cultural religious festivals as a springboard to talk about the new kingdom that he was ushering in and the New Testament that uh, would bring us true peace with God. Right. The, the theme of light, as we will see, is one that is just entirely rich in the scriptures and even in John's gospel itself, apart from whatever else was happening at the Feast of Booths. I, I did a little reading that, that suggested there is some, along with the water rituals of the Feast of Booths, there were some light rituals as well that maybe Jesus is building on. But again, even without that, we know that the theme of light and darkness is a huge one in the scriptures, as we will see today. So with that in mind, we're going to get the light of the world statement. But what all are we going to encounter in this text, just as a way of preview? Yeah, the best way for us to break down this text from verses 12 through 20 of John chapter 8 
is to see um, the beginning verse 8, 12 being the assertion that Jesus makes that he is the light of the world um, and whoever follows him would not walk in darkness, but would have the light of light. And then uh, we'll see the last verse is just going to be in verse 20, the, the context of the fact that he's speaking in the treasury. Um, but in the middle, verses 13 through 19, he's going to have a back and forth dialogue with the Pharisees who are going to be objecting to that claim of Jesus being light of the world because of its messianic undertones from Old Testament prophecy. And you will see Jesus and the Pharisees get into a bit of a argument uh, as to the authority by which Jesus could claim such a thing and whether that claim is truthful. Let's see how that comes forward in the text. We turn to John chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. It's our text for today. That is John 8, verses 12 to 20. So, Pastor Hill, we have in verse 12 another one of these I am statements of Jesus. Before we talk about what he says particularly, I am the light of the world, remind us what these I am statements are. What is the significance of Jesus speaking that way in several places in this gospel? Right. One of the most defining features of the Gospel of John is that John includes seven different I am statements of Jesus. These are statements that Jesus makes throughout the Gospel where not only is he creating some metaphor by which we would understand his relationship to us or his relationship to the Father and the kingdom of heaven, but he is really using the proper name of God, Yahweh in Hebrew, Ego, Ami in Greek, and using these in such a way that they would ring in the ears of the people and be a clear confession that he was claiming for himself the identity of Yahweh, of God himself, and speaking in a way that should just any normal person, normal observant Jew in those days speak, that it would be considered um, taking what belongs only to God and ascribing it to himself, which of course Jesus has every right to do. And which is why he's going to receive such a strong reaction from the Pharisees after this statement. As you mentioned, it's the second of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. Uh, and just as review, the other ones uh, are Jesus says that I am the bread of life in John chapter 6. That's the first statement. We have I am the light of the world here in 8.12. Jesus will later say I am the door in 10 verse 9. I am the good shepherd in 10 verse 11. I am the resurrection and the life in 11.25. I am the way and the truth and the life in 14.6. And finally, I am the true vine in 15 chapter 1. And that just helps us to see what John really wanted us to see all along about Christ as he writes his gospel, is that we should really understand that when we see Jesus, we are seeing God himself, that there's no doubt about it, that we uh, would not miss the divinity of Jesus and these I am statements that he so rightly um, sets down in in, uh, in pen for us is, is passed down for our benefit that we would never lose sight of the fact that in Christ we have the fullness uh, of deity dwelling bodily among us. So the particular I am statement that we have in our text is, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus is going to follow that up by talking about following him. But let's just take the statement itself, I am the light of the world. This is a really big theme scripturally light, where should we start as we try to unpack what Jesus is saying here? Well, I think this is a theme that we could overlook, honestly, if we didn't really take time to stop and think, where do we hear this theme all throughout the scriptures? And what we'll find really as a matter of looking at it first is that the theme of Christ as the light is something that really serves uh, the entirety of scripture almost from beginning to end. And we see 
this first idea of Christ as the light in Genesis chapter one. Uh, I think most of our listeners would have heard this before, but um, many times uh, observant theologians will say that uh, we can see the echoes of the Trinity from the very beginning of the scriptures, beginning in Genesis chapter one, verse one, it can be demonstrated at least, you know, by means of, of reading into the text that the entire Trinity is active there and really on display for us who have the benefit of the New Testament as we look back at the old in chapter one, verses one through three. So those opening words of the entire scripture say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now we could read that in a very straightforward manner, just for its uh, creational uh, account of, of where we all came from. But we can also see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see God, the father on display there in verse one. In verse two, it mentions that the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, the third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit. And in verse two, we hear, and God said, let there be light. And what does he say? But he speaks his word, which we understand later from the prologue of John, that the word was with God and the word was God, the second person of the Trinity. So the very word of God, the second person of the Trinity, that the word that is spoken into creation in Genesis 1, 3 takes the form of the phrase, let there be light. And I don't think that's really an accident on God's part, that, that light is the beginning of the story. Christ, uh, in the most important event of all of human history, as he reconciles us to his father, comes as the light of the world. Uh, and I think that would be the first place we would acknowledge this idea of Christ as light in the scriptures. Yeah. So, I mean, not to, and we're not saying that Christ was created, not that he was the created light, but that Christ as creator, he created light as the very first thing that is created. So the, you know, thinking through the the prologue of John's gospel, you brought up verse one, that the word was God. And then John continues that nothing was made apart from this word. And so the word who is God, he created light at the very beginning. So to hear Jesus say, I am the light of the world, that takes us to the very beginning of the scriptures where he made light. What about on the other end of the, the Bible? Right. And on the other end of the scriptures in Revelation, where we, we hear the account of John's uh, vision that he had on Patmos, the thing that we see in Revelation is it's the picture of, of the, the ultimate telos or end of, of the story for us. When, when sin is done away with, when God has uh, restored everything, new heavens and new earth have come for us as people. And we see things set back um, once again without sin or any trouble. And in Revelation 21, verses 22 through 24, it describes what this is going to be like. And it speaks in terms of the new Jerusalem. And in these verses, it says, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp mm. is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So the idea that there is no need of sun or moon anymore, no need of any external source of light because the lamb himself is the lamp and the light that lights the city of God um, is the same idea that uh, the light of day one of creation precedes the creation of the sun and moon. Uh, it, it is a light within itself that God gives graciously. And again, uh, you're... Your explanation of this is clear. We don't want to get into this idea of, of Christ as light being created. He is the one creating the light. But here at the end of the story in Revelation 21, we see that the lamb is the light uh, of the, the city of God. Yeah. So again, and this is what Jesus says then, I am the light of the world. So from beginning to the end of the scriptures, this is a theme that we're going to see, and Jesus explicates it here in John 8. Now, we've already made reference to John's gospel a couple times to chapter 1, to the prologue. Where else in, in John's gospel do we see this image of light, especially around Jesus and his teaching? Yeah, as I was preparing for today, I was really you know surprised to be reminded, I suppose, of what I already knew, of how prevalent the theme of, of Christ as the light is in the gospel of John. And it comes to us in four main sections of John. The first is the prologue of the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And here we see, um, we understand that Christ is identified as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But quickly, 
uh, the idea is that Christ is light as well. So that was John 1, 1, but it continues on from verse 2 and following. It says, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. For the man sent from God, whose name was John, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So we walk away from John 1 as an entire prologue most of the time, saying, you know, who does John or what does John identify Christ as in John 1? And I think most of us would say he's the word, which is very true. But in fact, this idea of him being the light is perhaps even more prevalent there in John chapter 1 than him being identified as the divine word or logos. So the the theme of Christ being light comes up at the very beginning of John's gospel. You said there's other places. Where's the next time we encounter this theme of light? So the next time we'll see the theme is going to be in chapter 3. And chapter 3 of John is, of course, Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus the Pharisee. And Nicodemus the Pharisee comes to Jesus uh, inquiring of him, and he comes under the cover of darkness at night so as to conceal the fact that he would be uh, willing to speak with Jesus. It would have put him at risk, and his standing as a Pharisee um, would have been in trouble if, if he would have even been seen with Christ. Now, of course, we know uh, the meat of John chapter 3, John 3, 16, but in the verses beyond that, um, Jesus speaks in verses 19 and following these words. He says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So there we have the light and the darkness again. But I think what starts to become clear if we, we really take time is that Jesus is doing something more with this idea of identifying himself as the light than just giving us a metaphor, I would say. He's doing more than just telling us, I'm kind of like light, and you know what light, light is like and darkness are like, so um, that tells you a little bit more of how I am. He's, he's making a, a deeper claim to say he is the light. So just as easily in John chapter 3, where he says the light has come into the world, we could say the Christ has come into the world. Uh, people loved the darkness rather than the Christ because their works were evil. He's using this not just necessarily metaphorically, but on some kind of an even deeper level about who he really is and what he does. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good point. And I, I think we would we'll probably come back to that thought that he is the light. He's not just like the light. And so this is it's a very important reminder. There are, imagine as we would go through the entirety of John's gospel, we could see this theme in many, many places. And in, in fact, I mean, I'm just thinking right now about the language that John speaks of Jesus' miracles, calling them signs. And the way that with a sign, there's something you need to see, but there have been those who have, quote, seen the sign, but they haven't seen the sign. That seems related to the theme of light. So we could probably do this all day in John's gospel. Where, where else do you see this theme of light, especially clearly? So again, um, light comes up in you know chapter eight would be the next place chronologically, which we're going to talk about here today. But after that, it comes up again in chapter 11, chapter 11 is laying the uh, groundwork for the raising of Lazarus in the section here. So here Christ, as the light comes up, as he hears that Lazarus is ill, he knows Lazarus is going to die. But what Jesus does upon that news is he states in the hearing of everyone that Lazarus' illness does not lead to death. Now, what he means, of course, is that it's not going to lead to death in an ultimate or final sense. And he says instead that Lazarus' illness is for the glory of God. And so he actually waits for two days before he goes anywhere, and then he slowly heads towards Lazarus' location where he's at sick in Judea because he wants to give the time for Lazarus' illness to overcome him so that his, his power and glory can be revealed in raising Lazarus. But on the way, he has this dialogue with his disciples in John 11, 8 through 11. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. 
But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. So again, we, we see Jesus speaking of the light. And, and what he says there later on is, if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I think does call back to what he says in chapter 8 that we're going to examine a little more about um, being in, in the light of Christ too. Uh, but here we have this against the background of, of death and resurrection as well. So that uh, the darkness can be seen, of course, as, as sin of, and the light as righteousness. But again, the darkness in context of Lazarus and, and the event there is seen as the darkness of death and the light as the light of, of the resurrection and this light of the life we have in Christ. Thinking of, of death and resurrection and the light and darkness themes that are there in chapter 11, what about during Holy Week? What light and darkness themes does John give us? Right. In John chapter 12, we hear the last time in John where Jesus speaks in terms of being the light. And it's in the context of the fact that he has come into Jerusalem, uh, Palm Sunday, those events of the cries of Hosanna have, have ceased. And now Jesus is seeing the impending spiritual darkness around him as he knows what he must do in going to the cross and the opposition against him. And he says in John 12, 36 or 35 and 36, he says, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. And then about 10 verses later, he says, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So uh, this just reminds me of the theme that uh, exists in our Holy Week services, especially our Good Friday Tenebrae service, which I would you know, hope most of our listeners have had the experience of going to. It's a service where we begin with seven candles on the altar, and they're progressively extinguished as the account of Good Friday and Jesus' passion is read. And we see the, the gathering darkness uh, around Christ as he's denied by his followers, as, as they scatter, as he's betrayed. Um, but the the wonder of the tenebrae service is that uh, the light does does not get overcome by darkness. And in our church, and I'm sure that many churches do this exactly the same way, we'll take uh, the paschal candle and we'll remove it from the altar for a time. Um, some churches, I, I suppose, may wait till Easter Sunday to to bring it back out. But at least in our church, as a reminder before the people leave, it's it's brought back out and set as the one sole light. Uh, in the sanctuary as we leave in darkness and quietness to remind us that that, that light could not be overcome by the, the darkness uh, that it surrounded Christ. With that mention of the Good Friday service and the, the way the darkness comes on Good Friday and then the light comes back at the Easter vigil or Easter morning, depending on, on how a congregation observes it, how how is this theme of Christ as the light seen in our our worship services, maybe during other parts of the year or in other services? Yeah, so the entire season of Epiphany really does uh, have the light theme to it, uh, as well as I suppose you could say the Advent time as we see the light um, growing at that time in the exact opposite way as we anticipate the birth of the Christ, uh, the light coming into the world. But in Epiphany especially, we recognize that uh, Jesus has come as a light not just for the Jews, but uh, a light to lighten the Gentiles as well. Uh, we think of epiphany even in our own common parlance of the way we might use the word today as epiphany. When you have an epiphany is when the light goes off, right? The little light bulb above one's head. Um, so this notion is, is there in the epiphany season, especially in our, our pericopes and our hymnody there. And I think that's just a, a wonderful place where the theme is, is uh, existing in, in our worship practices and in the church. But it's also all throughout hymnody. I mean, I had just a, a number of hymns come to mind. This is probably not only half of them that are in our hymnal that, that work on the light theme. I mean, we have, O God of God, O Light of Light, um, the wonderful hymn, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, um, Light of Light, O Soul Begotten. There, there are many others. So light uh, language is very present throughout our hymnody. And then in our worship life in the church, the evening prayer liturgy and the order of service there uh, begins with this service of light and um, and the theme of of the light um, that the darkness cannot overcome is there as the church lays itself down, readies itself to retire for the night. 
you know, we, we realize that even in the midst of the darkness that surrounds us physically, uh, Christ is our light in the midst of it all. And then we have liturgical candles, of course, including the Paschal candle that keeps our, our minds on this and um, probably many more things that I've not even brought to mind. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when you stop and think about just how big a role light plays both in the scriptures and then in our worship life, it, you probably would, it's, it's easy to miss something. So if we miss anything, dear listener, please let us know. What about uh, Pastor Hill? Does your, does your church there in Winchester have a, an eternal flame? I've, I've forgotten now, but many of our churches do. All right. It's confession time. We have an eternal flame, but it's not always eternal. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah. But Christ, the light of the world, is for even <laughs> even if your candle has gone out in your sanctuary, it, it's Christ, gone out the light a time of the world or two. Is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, but that, that too is another. That's just another one that came to my mind. That, that again in our in our worship lives, that you see that yes, Christ is the light of the world. When I do chapel with uh, preschool students, I often start by lighting the candles and I, I teach them that the reason we do that is because Jesus is the light of the world so that they will make that connection. And, and would that all Christians make that connection when they come to worship and they see those candles lit to recall that Christ is the light of the world and the good news that is for us. We're going to keep looking at that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking with Pastor Nate Hill about John chapter eight. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Monday, February 13th. We're studying John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20 with Pastor Nate Hill. He serves at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas. Pastor Hill, prior to the break, we were talking about this theme that is throughout the scriptures. It's in our worship services. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. We talked about how that theme, you can see it from Genesis to Revelation, and we've looked especially in John's gospel. We've also seen some of that the ways that this shows up in our worship services. In terms of Old Testament background, which we know is an important thing for John, what's the Old Testament background of Jesus saying, I am the light of the world? Right. It might be easy for us to, to hear Jesus' I am claim of I am the light of the world and see it as an assertion that he makes sort of out of nowhere with not a lot of connection to the, the Old Testament or to uh, the messianic expectations of the people. But that's actually not true. The idea of the light um, and coming into the people who have walked in darkness is is a very uh, common Old Testament theme. And I think the place that we would go to find uh, the greatest link between the clear messianic predictions of this light to come and Jesus fulfilling it would be in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 2 says this. It says, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them has light shone. So um, clearly, as Jesus makes this claim, I am the light of the world, he is laying claim to, to two things, that he is, number one, claiming divinity for himself by using uh, the name of Yahweh um, in the in the Greek language, anyway, um, and he is making clear the fact that he is the one who has promised to come, the Messiah who was to come. And we, of course, know everyone's messi messianic expectations 
were a little bit all over the map um, in those days. They might have expected, yeah. you know, a mighty king like David, but he's he's giving both of these si- these sides of the identity of who he is that he's the Messiah who was promised to come, and not only that, that Messiah who was promised was always going to be God coming to them in the flesh. Yeah, I mean, the passage from Isaiah nine is a good one to bring up. You mentioned previously how Simeon sings that you know the child Jesus is the light to lighten the Gentiles. And that comes up again in Isaiah, I think it's in chapter 49, in one of the places where the Isaiah speaks about the servant of the Lord, and it's, it's too small a thing that this servant would, would re- bring back Israel, and so the Lord makes the servant a light to the nations, and certainly that is Jesus as the servant of the Lord is the light to the nations, so that, that messianic connection is, is plain as well. I was doing a little bit of reading, and, and the Dr. Lenski, in his commentary, brought up a, a connection that I hadn't really thought about, but I, I found fascinating. He was talking about the Feast of Booths, and with the Feast of Booths, remembering that wandering in the wilderness, well, in the wilderness, the Lord led his people with that pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, and the connection of, of light, a, a, you know, a big light object leading the people, he suggested was a great connection to make here. And I, I I had never really thought about it, but I appreciate him bringing that out because Jesus says, you know, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. So that, that connection of the Lord leading his people in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, I think works really well here because it, it not only gets the aspect of following, but also makes the connection plain that Jesus, yes, he is claiming that he is that same God who led his people in the Old Testament. Now he's leading here in the New Testament as well. Yeah, that's a wonderful connection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, that would not have been lost on the original hearers. Yeah. So let's let's talk more about this this thought of of whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. I mean, we've we've gone throughout the scriptures, and again, we could we could continue doing this for the whole show, really finding these connections to light from the Old and New Testament to Jesus. Jesus gives us the way to apply it, though, right away, this thought of following him and not walking in darkness. Uh, what is Jesus saying? How is Jesus teaching us to apply these words as he continues? Right. Um, it, you know, he is a teaching us to uh, apply them to ourselves because his identity, um, all of the I am statements, really, they have uh, meaning to us and an application to us in our own life. You know, so on the one hand, okay, he's the light of the world. So what? You know, what difference does that make to me other than maybe checking the box that he fulfills the, uh, the prophecies in Isaiah and the Old Testament motifs that point forward to him. Um, and the fact that he follows this up with something that gives us um, a hope in our life and an application in our life is just a wonderful thing. And it's kind of a shame in a way that we reduce the I am statements to the, the first half of them rather than the second half mm-hmm. included as well. So as you mentioned, right, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, what Jesus is saying here is is he's giving us a promise, not a command so much, right? So the first half of the the second sentence is whoever follows me. And, and, you know, we might have our hackles up about, you know, it's not all about following Jesus. That can lead itself into works righteousness. Our our relationship with Christ is first um, given to us as a gift in baptism, all of which is true. But let's focus on, you know, the main point of what he's saying is that as we are following him as his, as his people, we won't walk in the darkness that we had walked in before and in which the world is currently walking today because we will have the light of life, he himself, uh, in us, with us, ever present among us. And, and that's just an amazing promise that shows what we have as Christians that the world so desperately needs. So, I mean, when Jesus talks about walking in darkness, then there's that, as you said, this is not just a, it's not a command, it's a promise. What's the darkness then that threatens us that he would lead us out of? Right. So the darkness that threatens us is, of course, the darkness of sin, the, the darkness of death, the darkness of the devil, the, the three that we always name in these times. But, um, you know, we, we can really put some flesh on, on each of those, you know, when we live a life that we think will be fulfilling based upon a life of the pursuit of pleasure and sin, you know, absent God, um, absent uh, his word, it, it's a very um, deceptive type of thing, right? It, it seems to promise us some kinds of satisfaction, some kind of happiness, 
And ultimately, what does it leave us? It leaves us completely unsatisfied, um, groping for something that would give us, you know, hope and enlighten our hearts. And it leads to, to darkness and, and really a, a spiritual depression. Um, so that's, that's what the world is walking around in absent Christ today. You know, people are following whatever the, the latest and greatest promises of something that will give them meaning in their life and they'll pursue it for a while and it'll leave them empty and they'll end up in a place that's, that's probably even darker than they feel like they began in. Um, and that's, that's where sin takes us. Um, death of course, is that ultimate darkness, that, that fear that people walk around with every day because they, they've not yet resolved the ultimate question of their life, which is why am I here? What am I to do? And what happens to me after I die? Um, and then finally, of course, uh, Satan himself, the prince of darkness would, would have us walk in a way that follows him rather than follows Christ. So, you know, we, we as Christians don't follow that path anymore. We don't grope around in the darkness seeking to find our own way, but instead we follow Christ who goes before us. And where does he go before us? Well, he goes before us having lived a perfect life for our sake, having gone to death, through death, and into the resurrection in the same way uh, that he so graciously promises he will pull us through. And, and that makes us people of light and a beacon of hope in the world. Okay, so I'm I'm glad you you said that that way that we are this beacon of light, hope in the world. Jesus here says, "I am the light of the world," and we know that that's where it starts. But if I can jump to Matthew's gospel for a second to the Sermon on the Mount, he also says to his disciples, "You are the light of the world." So how do those two things go together? That Jesus is the light of the world, and then that his his church, his disciples, are the light of the world. Right, because everything that Jesus is and everything that he has done for us, he, he gives to us as a gift. Jesus, the eternal son of God, enters into our world. He condescends in the best sense of the word to come down and live among us in this mess that we've made. And he redeems it. You know, he, he, he perfects it in the way that he lives and he undoes the curse of sin and death. And then he gives that to us as a gift in our baptism. You know, we... We die along with him and we are raised along with him in our baptism. And as we live the rest of our life, we are in him, in Christ. And because we are in him who is the, Christ, is the light of the world and he is in us, we can't help but be one that shines forth that very same, although it be it, you know, imperfect and subject to our own, our own foibles and troubles, but that shine forth that light to others in the world as we live according to uh, the, the joy that Christ has placed in us in the freedom uh, that he's given us from sin. Hmm. Yeah, and, and to think in John's gospel, John the Baptist functions in that way, that, that John bears witness to the light, even though he's not the true light. Jesus calls us the light of the world because we are in him. He is the source we reflect, we bear witness to that light. And so then also bring light to the world because we point to Jesus, who is the light of the world. Those who follow him do not walk in darkness, but they have the light of life. That is Jesus in John 8, verse 12. Anything more on that verse, Pastor Hill? No, I think we might want to move on. and Let's uh, see yeah. how the Pharisees react to this okay. amazing claim that Jesus makes. Okay, so what what is the objection we get in verse 13? Yeah, so it's interesting what they say to him. Uh, the Pharisees reply by saying, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. <laughs> you know, so that might catch us off guard as, as modern readers. One thing you'll notice is the Pharisees really don't immediately attack the substance of what he's saying. They're attacking the assertion he's making based on what might be seen as sort of a procedural grounds um, rather than substantial grounds. What they're doing is they're applying the standard that exists in the old covenant for the conviction of a crime to Jesus' own claim to be the light of the world. So there are a few uh, passages in the Torah that are operant here in uh, the underlying claim that they make. The first is Numbers 35, verse 30, which says, if anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Deuteronomy 17, 6 says, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. 
And then in Deuteronomy 19, 15, the same principle is used, but just not in uh, only the case of, of capital murder. It says, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Of course, we can recognize, you know, the reason that God put this in the old covenant that a false witness would not be able to result in the, the life being taken from an innocent party. But the Pharisees are essentially putting Jesus on trial here using his words. Um, they're, they're turning upside down the process, right? They're saying that if he's going to make such a, a large claim that he can't be the only one to say it, otherwise all he's doing is testifying to his own self. Hmm. So Jesus then is going to respond in verse 14 to this, what seems to be a, a primarily a procedural argument at this point. How does Jesus begin to respond as he's put on trial in this way? So he says, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. All right. So a couple things here in verse 14 is Jesus knows that he is the one who certainly is not subject to this particular uh, intricacy of the Old Testament law because he knows where he came from and where he's going, which of course is, is from, from heaven itself. He's God himself. He's come from God the Father into this world. He will return to God the Father in his ascension to sit at his right hand. And there's, there's no possibility of falsehood within him because of who he is. Um, as God, uh, he does not lie. He is, uh, speaking the, the word of truth at all times, uh, in, in a, a way that, that could never be used to deceive. And, um, he, he knows all of that about himself, even if the Pharisees, most of them are blind to it. And then he uses this phrase, you do not know where I come from or where I am going. And, and that's interesting here. I think in some sense, many of the Pharisees did not know where he was from or where he was going. Um, you'll see they're not necessarily right here just accusing him of being only a carpenter's son. You know, um, he's not in his hometown of Nazareth at this point of time. Um, instead, what's going on is um, they're, they're seeing him as someone who's kind of arisen out of the blue. Um, yet, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be seen as judging him in a way that's not appropriate to judge him uh, as we continue on in the next verse. Mm, yeah, and, and just as a thinking through the way this conversation has gone so far, you know, we spent all that time talking about how Jesus, how Jesus is the light of the world, and all that means. And now it it seems like that theme has receded into the background. I don't think it's entirely gone at this point because you have not only in this text but in the text to follow the idea of of what truth is, where truth comes from, and light is something that reveals the truth. And and even in one commentary. That this is a really helpful comment that the light actually does bear witness to itself. You know, if you imagine a dark room and you see a light, you don't actually need another witness telling you that there's a light because you see the light from itself. Now, Jesus, we're going to see, does invoke other witnesses, and he has already in chapter five, he's going to bring up his father here again. But just to, to keep that connection in mind that Jesus is the light of the world. Here he's speaking about his the truth that he's preaching. I think that's a helpful reminder just to kind of tie these things together. So in, in verse 15, then, Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. What does Jesus mean when he tells them they're judging according to the flesh? Yeah, so when he says you're judging according to the flesh, they're judging according to what they can naturally perceive. They're judging according to uh, worldly standards, materialistic standards. Um, they're only able to, to see what they can uh, perceive with their senses, so to speak. And that's actually not that different than the way many people judge things today. Um, people who are not in the light of Christ, um, oftentimes what we say about the hope that we have and uh, the, the scripture that's been revealed to us seems to be foolishness to them because it's not something that they can observe with their senses in front of them in an experiential materialistic type of way. And here the Pharisees, who should have been the spiritual people uh, amongst them, are the ones that can only see things, you know, according to the flesh. Um, the second statement, I think, stands separately from it and stands on its own, where Jesus says, you judge according to the flesh. Um, but then he says, I judge no one. 
you know, that really kind of threw me when I, I first, you know, was pondering that for our discussion yeah. today. He, he judges no one. I sit there and say, well, that's not really true, right? Um, right. He's going to uh, overturn the tables of the money changers. He has harsh words for the, uh, the Pharisees um, and, um, and those who, who can't see who he is. And I think, I think what he means is a couple things. Uh, we can look at this in a couple ways. First off, he judges no one according to the flesh, right? Um, he, yeah. he judges by the heart and judges differently. Um, so he doesn't make the error in judgment that the Pharisees are making. And the other thing is that, you know, we're, we recall that in his first coming, in his first advent, he comes first um, in a gracious form, in a lowly form. Um, he judges no one in the sense that even for those who have um, put him upon the cross, he prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He comes not to condemn, but to save in his first coming. Um, but the next verse is going to remind us of the other side of that coin, where in verse 16, he continues on and says, yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the father who sent me. So he, he pushes their minds forward to the day that's yet to come that, that last day in which we do know Christ will come in judgment, uh, to divide the sheep from the goats, um, those who are in Christ from those who are in their sin. Hmm. Yeah, I think what you said about that, I judge no one according to the flesh, I think is a really helpful statement, especially as Jesus does continue, as you said, with the judgment he does render in verse 16. In verse 17, then he says, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. And then he says, I'm the one who bears witness about myself and the father who sent me bears witness about me. What's the, the point Jesus makes there? Yeah, he says, look, your, your procedural argument here is, is ridiculous in the first place, right? That um, even if we're going to say that it requires two people, then fine. The two people are me and my father uh, who has sent me. And, you know, he, he says in another place that I and the father are one, right? Um, that, that they are one in their purpose and um, in their essence, even, of course, as we know in our Trinitarian uh, theology, and that he reveals what the father wants to be revealed. He speaks, and when he speaks, he speaks in the same voice that the father does. Um, so even though he's the only one standing before them in the flesh that day, he's not the only one bearing witness to the truth of who he is. And of course the father does bear witness, um, in Jesus baptism at the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, and even in the events of, of the temple curtain being torn into at Jesus crucifixion, where he as father even steps in momentarily to bear witness to who Jesus is and what he's doing for the people. Now, in verse 19, the Pharisees, again, that's the audience and mentioned in verse 13, they respond with another question, where is your father? We've seen things like this happen in John's gospel before. Uh, Nicodemus comes to mind right away where Jesus says, you know, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how's that going to work? How am I going to go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? It seems that there's a, a similar misunderstanding here by the Pharisees. They say, where is your father? The the ESV, I notice, has the word father capitalized, but I don't know that that's what they mean by it. What, what is going on there in verse 19? What's their question of Jesus? Right. So I think, you know, one of two things could be happening, and I, th I think I know which one I, I favor as the a better interpretation. But one thing that could be happening is they could be uh, laying a trap for him, right? So I suppose they could be laying a trap saying, this guy thinks he's the son of God. Uh, let's get him to say that that's who he is, and then we can uh, we can pounce on him for blasphemy. That's that's a possibility, I suppose. But I think the more likely thing that's taking place is exactly what took place with Nicodemus: is that they're just obtuse, right? They're not uh, they're not following the reality of what's going on. I think they are asking, as you mentioned, probably, where is your father with a little f, your earthly father? Who's this guy that you're talking about that you said who sent you and bears witness about about you? And so they're, they're looking for the Joseph figure in his life. And of course, you know, uh, best we can figure is that Joseph is long gone by the time that Jesus' ministry begins. We don't hear of him anymore, although we hear of his mother, Mary, and he had likely passed away and was, was with the Lord already. Um, but I think they're being a bit obtuse. One commentator had mentioned that uh, these Pharisees stand in to play um, a, a character that he calls the straight man, like the person who just doesn't get what's going on, that Jesus can bounce things off of so that the other people around can come to a place of understanding. They're a, a dialogue partner 
um, who are just enabling Jesus' teaching to continue on in the hearing of others that others might understand, even if they're the ones who miss it. So talk about Jesus' response to them then as, as the conversation, at least where we have, wraps up. What does Jesus say to this question? So Jesus answers, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And that's pretty amazing too, because they claim to be sons of Abraham. They claim to be the ones upon whom God has placed his, his favor, the ones that God has elevated amongst all of the nations. And they, the Pharisees, stand as uh, really, in their minds, the pinnacle of those people as well. Yet uh, Jesus tells them that because they can't recognize the light, then they don't know the Father that they claim to know in the first place. Because if they did, they would have known the promise that the Father had given to uh, all of their forefathers. The fact that he would send a Messiah someday, one that would set the world right from sin, one that would fix the problem that had begun all the way back in Eden, one that would crush the, the head of the serpent, and one who would provide uh, salvation not only to the people of Israel, but would even be a beacon to the nations and bring light to them and, and cause all of them to come to Zion to and, and receive this salvation that he would accomplish for all people. So they're blind. They have lived a life where they've enjoyed the privilege of um, religious stature, but in reality, they don't even know the God whom they claim to serve. Mm, yeah, Jesus says that here in in a negative sense, you know, you don't know the Father because you don't know me. We shouldn't fail to miss, though, the the positive side that this relates to where Jesus will explicate elsewhere. When you've known Jesus, when you've seen Jesus, you have known the Father and you have seen him. That is the, the positive side of this promise to those who believe. I have about two minutes here on the morning, Pastor Hill. Help us to, to wrap things up on this rich text. Give us the good news about Jesus being the light of the world. Right. I think there are a couple things that we can we can grasp onto here and as we bring things to a close. As you mentioned, there is that wonderful statement, if you knew me, you would know my father also. You know, there are so many things about God that we feel are hidden in this world. You know, why would God do this? Why would God do that? Why would God allow this tragedy? Why would God not intervene in this particular way? If we go down that path and are searching after God as he exists in his his hiddenness, as he uh, is is transcendent above us, uh, it can be something that is really disheartening. But when we take to heart this idea that if we know Jesus, we come to know the Father also, it gives us something to hold on to as Jesus has come in the flesh to make himself accessible, to make God accessible to man. He walked um, in the very presence of the disciples. He walked in front of these Pharisees that day, and he came so that we would be able to to hear God speak to us uh, even in a, a human, immediate voice and one that's been preserved so faithfully for us in the scriptures. So I, I think the encouragement today is that we come to the light. We come to the light as a beacon of hope. Uh, we come to the light as a place that we we know that as we see Jesus, we see the Father. And, and that should be our comfort today that just what he said, he is the light of the world and whoever follows him, we're not going to walk in darkness anymore, but we'll have that true light of light that will enable us not only uh, to lighten the darkness of our own hearts, but to shine that light out to others that they might have the same. Pastor Nate Hill is pastor at St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Winchester, Texas, helping us today with John chapter 8, verses 12 to 20. Pastor Hill, thanks for being our guest today. Great to be with you. Jesus is the light of the world. Those who follow him do not walk in darkness, but they have the light of light. That is you and me, dear Christians. We have the light of light following Jesus. This is his promise. Follow him. Walk in the light of his truth. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about the gospel according to St. John, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.